Uh, some of y'all are awake. Uh, a few of y'all. So, Confederate capitals. Somebody name them for me while I get my notes out. Montgomery, Montgomery, Danville, Dan, Charlotte. You got three. You got three or four of the five. What's the other? Uh, right down the road from where we're at. Greensboro. 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 I'll even throw in Abbeville, South Carolina. Well, of course. Uh, <laughs> Confederate capitals. Uh, for the longest time, uh, if you go online, there's an organization called the Civil War Trust, which is a fantastic organization. They raise tens of thousands of dollars every year to buy battlefield property. Great organization. They got a lot of educational resources, and if you click on the one about Confederate capitals, it's got Montgomery, it's got Richmond, and it's got Danville. We get left out of the picture. It is my argument that North Carolina truly is the last capital of the Confederacy. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to tell you why that I believe that. Montgomery is a great place to start this discussion. Montgomery, Alabama. I was in Alabama about a month ago sharing with them the same thing that I'm sharing with you this evening. And it was hot down in Montgomery, Alabama. Very warm down there. Montgomery is a great place to talk to, to, to begin this discussion. The delegates from the Deep South states meet there in February of 1861. And they put together a government. And uh, the representatives are there on February 8th. They adopt the Provisional Confederate Constitution. That Provisional Constitution will govern the Confederate States of America for the next few months. They get together the following day, and they, amongst themselves, amongst the delegates, elect Jefferson Davis, the provisional president of the Confederate States of America. Jefferson Davis was not even there. Y'all have heard the thing about if you don't want to get volunteered, you need to show up for the meeting. Mm -hmm. Jefferson Davis had resigned his seat from the United States Senate and had went back to Mississippi and was working in his rose garden when word arrived that he was now the provisional president of the Confederate States of America. Takes him a few days to get to Montgomery. When he gets to Montgomery on uh, February 18th of 1861, he is inaugurated as our provisional president. And he goes to work building a cabinet and with a group of selected leaders organizing a government. Because we started from scratch. We have this great history that we inherited from the United States, Constitution, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. but we're really building this government from scratch. On March 11th of 1861, the permanent Constitution of the Confederate States of America is adopted, and the first week of April, Jefferson Davis and his cabinet members start planning what eventually becomes the capture of Fort Sumter. We demanded that surrender from Robert Anderson. He refused, we bombarded the fort, and then the fort capitulated a few days later. In the spring of 1861, there are a lot of places vying to be the permanent capital of the Confederate States of America. Montgomery wants to be the capital. There are some folks, politicians and newspaper editors, who propose giving the Confederate government a, uh, a large piece of land just outside of Montgomery where they can build a capital. They wanted to be called the District of Davis in honor of Jefferson Davis. Also in the running were Huntsville, Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Selma, Shelby Springs, and Spring Hill. All of those are cities there in Alabama. Tuscaloosa went as far as to send delegates to the Confederate congressmen, they're now congressmen, meeting there in the city saying, look, we have all of these buildings. Tuscaloosa had been the capital of Alabama for many, many years. We have all of these buildings. You can use them if you will move the Confederate government to Tuscaloosa. Also in the running were Atlanta, Georgia, Nashville and Memphis, Tennessee, and Pendleton, South Carolina, as well as Alexandria, Virginia. Where does Alexandria, Virginia sit? Across the, river. Across the Potomac River from Washington City. Would that not have been an interesting sight to have these two <coughs> capitals of these two countries literally within a cannon shot, right across the chain bridge from each other? Maybe that is why the Yankees went and captured Alexandria, Virginia so soon after the conflict started. I can't say that for certain. Maybe it's a possibility. On April 27th of 1861, the Virginia Secession Convention sent a resolution to Jefferson Davis and the Confederate delegates in Montgomery, offering them the use of Richmond as the Confederate capital. 
Confederate Congress got together and debated it and eventually passed a resolution that moved the Congress to Richmond. It was a resolution that Jefferson Davis vetoed because it only moved the Congress. So the Confederate representatives got back together and hashed it out again. And eventually on uh, May 20th, they came up with a resolution that moved the entire government to Richmond, Virginia. Jefferson Davis signed this one. Congress appropriated $40,000 to cover the move, which is a remarkable sum. How much money did they have in the bank? <coughs> Absolutely nothing. Appropriated $40,000 to cover the move, and with that, Congress adjourned, and all of the delegates and representatives got on the train or got on the steamboats and left Montgomery. And Montgomery ceased to be the Confederate capital. Notable buildings that they used while in Montgomery included the Alabama State Capitol on Goat Hill. That is where Jefferson Davis was sworn in. Uh, they used the Montgomery Insurance Agency. It was the Confederate building, Confederate office structure while they were in Richmond. Uh, they used the Noble Brothers building. Alexander Stevens stayed at Mrs. Elizabeth Cleveland's boarding house. And a lot of the work regarding the rules that govern the convention or the Congress redoing the Confederate, redoing the United States Constitution, molding it into the Confederate Constitution, took place in her parlor at that boarding house. A lot of the other delegates stayed at the Exchange Hotel, and many of the backroom debates took place in that cigar-smoked, filled barroom, like who would actually become Confederate president. They had already hashed that out before they got to the floor of the Alabama State Capitol. So it would look like we were all of one accord. We have never been all of one accord. But at least that was the image that they wanted to portray. Everyone recognizes Richmond, Virginia as the Confederate capital. Davis arrived on May 29th of 1861. He only had four blocks to go from the depot where his train stopped to the Spotswood Hotel where he was staying. But it took hours. There were thousands of people gathered. Everybody wanted to shake Jefferson Davis's hand to tell him, you're doing a great job. We are on the right path. There were people shedding tears in the street. Jefferson Davis moved into the Spotswood Hotel. A lot of folks consider it the cradle of the Confederacy, but to be honest, a lot of the hard work up to that point of time had already taken place in Montgomery. Confederate government quickly engulfed Richmond. The United States Customs House became the primary government office. Jefferson Davis moved his office into the judge's chamber, and the old courtroom became the primary cabinet meeting room slash war room for the Confederate States of America. I posted on my blog, uh, I wrote something about two months ago, maybe three months ago, about the pictures I wish I had. I wish I had a picture of that courtroom. They talk about how there were huge maps on the wall that showed the Confederate states and showed the border states. I wish I had a picture of Jefferson Davis's office. I've been at this 30-some years, and I don't believe those pictures exist. They used the Mechanics Institute there uh, in Richmond. It became home to the Treasury Department, the War Department, the Navy Department, the Judicial Department. The YMCA building housed the Patent Office and numerous brick tobacco warehouses became either hospitals or became prisoner of war facilities there in Richmond. When the Confederate Congress was in session, they used the Virginia State House, a building that was designed by Thomas Jefferson to build in the late 1700s. On a rainy day in February of 1862, Jefferson Davis walked to the front porch of that building, the Virginia State House, and was sworn in as the first permanent president and the only permanent president of the Confederate States of America. Davis then got to work. Major military campaigns like uh, the first Maryland campaign, the Gettysburg campaign, the attempts to save Vicksburg were planned or at least approved there in Richmond in Jefferson Davis's office. Major industrial products, things for the war effort like cannons, uh, like rifles, like uniforms, like cartridges, they were all manufactured there in Richmond, Virginia. The Tredegar Iron Works was the largest facility in the South, largest iron works in the South. They were making cannons for the United States government before the war. They manufactured cannons for the Confederate States government once the war began. The iron plating for the CSS Virginia was produced there at Tredegar Iron Works. 
Davis and the other Confederate leaders had to deal with problems at home as well, including rising food prices, devalued currency, fallout from the Conscription Act, fallout from the Tax in Kind Act, overcrowding, and on a couple of occasions, even civil unrest there in Richmond itself. Refugees, government employees, wounded and sick soldiers, and their families quickly pushed the population of Richmond from around 40,000, maybe just a little shy of that number at the beginning of the war, to 100,000 people in 1862. And as we get on into 1863 and 1864, there are 120, 130,000, maybe even more people in Richmond, Virginia. There were times in which the war itself was on the very doorsteps of the Confederate capital. In the spring of 1862, George B. McClellan landed an army on the peninsula to the east, a federal army to the east of Richmond, and he pushed up so close that the Yankee soldiers wrote that they could see the church spires and hear the bells on Sunday morning. We know that Robert E. Lee took command of the Confederate Army after Joe Johnston was wounded at Seven Pines and pushed the federal army back down the peninsula. And then in 1864, there was a cavalry raid against Richmond. And on the body of a dead Union colonel, who I actually visited his grave, uh, there's a Confederate general buried in the same cemetery in Philadelphia. I was there about two weeks ago. On the body of this dead federal cavalry <coughs> colonel, they found papers. He was killed in the outskirts of Richmond. Those papers authorized him to burn the city and assassinate Jefferson Davis. Their dream of an independent Southern Confederacy came to a crashing halt on the morning of April 2nd of 1865. Federal forces broke through the Confederate lines below Petersburg, forcing the Confederate government to evacuate the capital city. That train bearing Davis and almost all of the cabinet pulled out of Richmond at 11 p.m. that evening. There were 10 other trains in front of his leaving the city. Richmond was soon ablaze. All the naval vessels were destroyed, cotton, tobacco, and military stores that could not be transported out of the capital city were set on fire. In the end, an estimated 900 homes and businesses were destroyed. These included two hotels, all of the banks, three newspapers, numerous mills, drugstores, groceries, saloons, shops, and warehouses, along with the county courthouse and several government buildings. As a historian, I read those accounts of the government employees taking those documents out of the buildings and piling them in the streets and setting them on fire. And it makes my heart break. There are so many things I would like to know so much more about. They were probably torched there to keep them from falling in the federal hands. Danville is also widely recognized as the capital of the Confederacy, even though I'm not so sure they want that title anymore things that have occurred recently. Confederate government's trip from Richmond to Danville took 16 grueling hours. Between 4 and 5 in the afternoon of April 3rd, Davis and his government pulled into the train station. Local people had gathered with their carriages and their hacks and their buggies and quickly took the government officials to various houses and homes across <coughs> the town. Everyone began working on the morning of April 4th. They wanted the Confederate people to see the government in operation something was going on. The Benedict House, which had served as a girls' school prior to the war, became the primary government office. While waiting for word from the Army of Northern Virginia, Davis drafted a proclamation. He wanted to inspire hope in the Southern people, to keep them fighting, to keep them growing food, to keep sending those soldiers back to the front lines. Just how widely his proclamation was distributed we can't say. I have found it in two newspapers and that's it. It would be his last. Word from Lee's army arrived on April 10th. The Army of Northern Virginia had surrendered. With no principal army left in Virginia and with the Federals just a couple counties away, Jefferson Davis decided that Danville was not a good place to be. So he and almost all of the cabinet members loaded on a train and that very evening pulled out of the station and headed toward Greensboro, North Carolina. The train bearing the Confederate government rattled into the station around 8 a.m. on April 11th. Federal cavalry came that close to capturing Jefferson Davis. His train had just passed over 
uh, a, uh, the Ready Fork Creek trestle when Stoneman's raiders arrived and torched that trestle that is drained and just passed. Five minutes behind. That's how close they came. When Jefferson Davis was told that news, he stated, quote, a miss is as good as a mile and didn't mention it anymore. On arriving at the station, Davis gave a short proclamation to a group, a, a short speech to a group of well-wishers that had gathered there and then tried to find a place to stay. Greensboro was seriously overcrowded. There were sick and wounded soldiers that had been sent from Richmond to Danville into Greensboro. There were wounded soldiers that had come from the Battle of Bentonville and were in Greensboro. There were refugees trying to escape Sherman's army as he came up out of the eastern parts of the state of North Carolina. They were in Greensboro. Jefferson Davis managed to secure a small room in a house one of his aides were renting. The house only had two rooms. He stayed there a couple of nights and then gave it up and went back to where the rest of his cabinet was staying. Which was where? A passenger car on a railroad siding. While in Greensboro, North Carolina, Davis, the Confederate cabinet, made one important decision. They agreed to allow Joseph E. Johnston to open negotiations up with William T. Sherman. <coughs> Davis, believing that this was futile, made some preparations for the further retreat of the Army of Tennessee, and then he and most of the cabinet, all of the cabinet at that point in time, left Greensboro. But instead of being able to take that train that they had taken from Richmond to Danville and Danville to Greensboro, they were forced to mount horses or to be pulled in ambulances and wagons across the countryside. Stoneman's raiders had cut the rail lines and they were forced to go over them. Jefferson Davis and his group moved from Greensboro through High Point down to Salisbury, Concord, and eventually rode into Charlotte, North Carolina. Greensboro and Charlotte are not often, are not often viewed as capitals of the Confederacy. In Greensboro, their stay was short and they really didn't make any attempt to open up offices. That is not true in Charlotte. In Charlotte, the government moved into a bank building. And unlike Danville or Greensboro, the entire Confederate cabinet was present holding meetings, trying to do work, trying to continue the war to inspire people. They used the Bank of Mecklenburg building on Trade Street. Day, decades later, it was recalled that both day and night sessions of the Confederate cabinet were held in this building, particularly in the office of the bank president. Davis met with several of his generals, including Wade Hampton and Joseph Wheeler, who were attempting to organize cavalry to continue the struggle. He also received news of the fall of Mobile, Alabama and Columbus, Georgia. One citizen even recalled that Davis entertained a party of ladies coming to pay their respects to the Confederate president. <coughs> Weighing heavily upon the minds of Davis and his cabinet were the negotiations going on between Joseph E. Johnston and William T. Sherman. That note that Johnston had passed on to Sherman on April 14th asked for a temporary suspension of hostilities so that the civil authorities could enter into the needful arrangements to terminate the existing war. Sherman wrote back as soon as he got Johnston's note, agreeing to a halt of the hostilities. And he agreed to offer the terms identical to the ones that Grant had given Lee at Appomattox. But then he added, this is Sherman's words. Quote, that I really desire to save the people of North Carolina the damage that they would sustain by the march of his army through the central or western parts of the state. Johnston received Sherman's reply on April 16th. It was Easter morning. They met the next day at the Bennett House, a place that many of y'all are familiar with here in this room. Once again, Johnston went in and asked for an armistice, and these are his words, an armistice as would give opportunity for negotiations between the civil authorities of the two countries. Sherman said that was not possible, as the United States government had always failed to recognize the Confederate States government. They met for a couple hours, they broke apart, they got together the next day, and Joseph E. Johnston gave Sherman some surrender documents, which Sherman dismissed as being, quote, uh, so general and verbose that they were inadmissible. Sherman then drafted his own surrender documents. Now, I grew up in the South. I don't like Sherman. 
Anybody here like Sherman? <coughs> Usually when I say that, everybody boos. I don't like Sherman. Boo. Thank you. Uh, having grown up in the South, especially the Deep South, and had stories passed down about some of the things that his men did uh, as they moved out of Atlanta through Georgia and South Carolina. But I, and I don't understand how Sherman got in the position that he did outside of that Grant Lighttail. Maybe there's some flavor of crazy that bound those two, I'm not so sure. Um, but the, the terms that Sherman drafted are truly remarkable, and it almost cost him his job. Sherman wrote, literally with his own hand, this is what Sherman wrote. Uh, he called for the Confederate armies to be disbanded, weapons were to be deposited at armories at state capitals, state political leaders had to take the oath prescribed by the Constitution of the United States, Federal courts were to be re-established and a general amnesty was granted to the men who would resume peaceful pursuits. And then the important part, at least if you're Jefferson Davis or John C. Breckinridge or John Reagan or George Trenholm, the important part, the United States government would not, quote, disturb any of the people by reason of the late war. So long as they lived in peace and quiet, abstained from acts of armed hostility, and obeyed the laws and existence of the place of their residence. Any people. That covered Jefferson Davis and Alexander Stevens and, and other political leaders. Sherman sent a copy to Washington City. Andrew Johnston is now President of the United States. Lincoln's been assassinated. Joseph E. Johnston sent a copy to Jefferson Davis in Charlotte. Davis convened the Confederate cabinet and asked for their members' views in writing on both the military situation in the South and the terms that Johnston and Sherman had worked out. <coughs> this takes, takes place there in the bank building on Trade Street, downtown, as they call Uptown Charlie. The cabinet members agreed that resources for continuing the war were available, but the Southern citizens, after four years of bloodshed, had lost the will to fight. Everyone was in agreement that Davis should accept the terms. The Confederate cabinet formed just four years earlier had rendered its final guidance to the Confederate president. This is on April 24th of 1865. I'm sorry, that's two days before that, April 22nd. Yet Davis continued to wait. He continued to drag his feet. He believed in the southern people that they would rise up. What is Jefferson Davis's goal at this point as he sits there in Charlotte in April of 1865? His goal is to move across South Carolina, Georgia, Alabama to get to the Trans-Mississippi Department to raise up a new army and to continue the fight. He believes that the southern people, after they go home, the soldiers, after they go home, take care of their families, put in crops, will flock back to the flag and that there is still hope that the Confederate States of America can survive. That is what he believes in. And it takes him two days of agony. I'll go back and read the recounts of the people who were there, his cabinet members, of agony, to finally say on April 24th, okay, I will agree to those terms. Yet on that same day, word arrives from Washington City and from Sherman that the United States government has rejected those terms. They tell Sherman that you are, have overstepped your bounds, that you are meddling in civil affairs. They actually send Grant, U.S. Grant, to Raleigh. How many of you all know that Grant wound up in Raleigh? U.S. Grant to Raleigh to take over the negotiations from Sherman. Grant shows up. I imagine he sits Sherman down. I bet you didn't know Sherman was sitting there tonight. Sets Sherman down and has a little talk with him. And Sherman goes and gives Johnston the news and eventually the same terms that Grant had given me at Appomattox. On April 25th of 1865, the Confederate government truly began falling apart. Attorney General George Davis submits his reg resignation, effective the next day. On that morning, right before George Davis resigned, his, his resignation is effective, Jefferson Davis and all of the Confederate cabinet have a final meeting. George Trenholm, the Secretary of the Treasury, has been sick, and he is at the Pfeiffer House in downtown Charlotte. And the cabinet members and Jefferson Davis all go there to have one final full meeting of the Confederate.
cabin. A member of the Pfeiffer family recalled, quote, the flutter of excitement created in the household when word came that there was to be a short meeting of the cabinet in Mr. Trenholm's room. They remembered seeing these distinguished gentlemen, bowed in sorrow, come in a body and pass in the sick room to confer together on the last momentous concerns of the lost cause. Trenholm would soon follow George Davis's lead and resign. We don't know if he resigned <coughs> while he was in Charlotte or if he resigned while the group moved further just across the, the North Carolina, South Carolina line. Got three documents that say he resigned in Charlotte, and three say that he waited to got to South Carolina. From April 11th until April 26th, North Carolina served as the capital of the Confederacy. For those 15 days, the Old North State stood guard over the end of their dream. As the Confederacy's dying hopes were kept alive, by the faith that Jefferson Davis had in our southern ancestors. Nevertheless, even at the end, Davis was forced to admit defeat. He agreed to surrender to the federal authorities. How did they allow it? Montgomery witnessed the glorious birth of our beloved Confederacy. Richmond proudly displayed its banners through its zenith, the days of bright hopes and the darkest of hours. Danville, Greensboro, and Charlotte bore witness to its humble demise. Glimpses of the Confederacy can be found, if you go quickly, in all of these places. You can stand on the state capitol steps on that porch in Montgomery, right next to that star where Jefferson Davis was standing when he was sworn in the provisional president of the Confederacy. You can go walk the streets of Richmond. Carefully, though. Walk the streets of Richmond. Go to the White House of the Confederacy, which surprisingly during the war was not white. It was gray. You can go to Oakwood Cemetery. And Hollywood Cemetery and visit their graves. You can go to Danville to the Sutherland Mansion, which at one time proudly proclaimed being the last capital of the Confederacy. You can go to Greensboro and see the historical markers. You can go to downtown Charlotte and see the historical markers. There are glimpses of the Confederacy, but I argue the Confederacy doesn't live in those places. <coughs> Confederacy lives in our hearts and it flows through our veins, the blood that's in our bodies. We, the descendants of, their, of the Confederate soldiers. And if we have any hope whatsoever, any hope that we ever get back to where they were, fighting for what they were fighting in, go back and read what they wrote. What did they want? A limited government. That's what they were after. It's up to us, the men and the women and the young folks sitting in this room, to go out there and tell that story to a population that has it wrong and that is hell-bent on destroying everything that our ancestors put up and believed in so many years after the war. It's up to us. Do you have any questions? 